familiar with um, trading and explaining. Um, and so I was asked to explain what trading was. Um, when you are trading, um, several things are happening. Um, look, some people call it an offer, you know, call it an offering, call it a tithe, call it a trade. At some point, it just, it's, it ends up all being just semantics. But to a certain extent, trading is about opening your heart towards a particular revelation. And so when you're trading or you're sowing or you're giving into something, what you're doing is you're beginning to open yourself. So you're giving finance towards a certain thing. Um, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. And so when you're giving into something, what is happening is you're beginning to open your heart into that particular direction. Um, and that is really the easiest way to explain what trading is. There's trading floors and there's trading this and there's trading that. But in the end, that's what um, trading is. And so um, this morning, um, Chris is going to start and Chris is going to talk for as long as Chris wants to talk. So um, I'm going to take a break from talking and highlight Chris here and say, welcome, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Good night, mum. <laughs> First, I'd like to say, uh, does everyone like my mum's new glasses? <laughs> she's got new gla- if she's on video there, yeah. Mom, you look great. <laughs> Keep her muted. <laughs> All right, good morning. Well, uh, this is an honor. It's an honor to be preaching with, with Joseph Sturgeon again. And um, I haven't... Uh, um, we haven't spoken together for a long time, even though we've been friends for a long time. And neither of us were in ministry when we, when we, uh, when we, oh, I think I was. No, no, I was not. No, neither of us were in ministry when we met. And then uh, Joseph went back in, in about, was it six, seven, about five years ago, 2015 or something? Yep. And then, uh, and then I started uh, last year. So, um, Joseph's done a lot of hard work in uh, building a platform for me. He's sort of like John the Baptist for my ministry. He can now decrease as I increase. So everyone's happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it is an honor. Joseph, you are an incredible human being. Um, I've met great theologians who I don't want to spend any time with. I've met uh, great people that, that don't really know God. <laughs> and uh, you are you are the composite whole. I really enjoy you. I love being with you. So crazy being in your town and not be able to see each other <laughs> by government mandate. Brilliant. But um, yeah, anyway, we'll catch up. But um, uh, and what you shared last night is just an exceptional, uh, mature message that you have owned over such a long period of time. And when so many people uh, are trading on their revelation, if I can use that term. They see something, perceive something, and put it on Facebook the next day uh, to buy into people's souls or to make up for uh, where they don't know they're loved. So I'm not judging them. I'm just saying that's their situation. Uh, and someone like yourself will sit on something for 10 years before you release it. Or And then I know who you run your things past as well, and you're very accountable to these things. So it's very safe for us in uh, the, shall we say, this community, whatever we want to call this community, to have people such as yourself, because you, uh, because lots of things we talk about, they are subjective. And to have someone who's walked in it for so long and has been trialed on it for so long, especially earlier in the piece when nobody knew who you were and you had to stand in the same thing for no reward. <laughs> um, it, it, people like yourself, people like Ian, people like Dr. O, uh, who really walked in it and demonstrate in their lives. And on top of that, uh, are good souls as well. It's a very unique position. So I'm very grateful for to have you in the body and to have you as a friend. So thank you, Joseph. All right. Thanks, bro. <laughs> um, I'm going to just start in prayer and then I'm going to get into it because I assume that if you know, if you're in a Joseph Sturgeon conference, then you have uh, been seeking for a while, (laughs) especially this one. Okay. So we all, I'm not praying. We're all going to heaven together. We're all there. 
We all just appear on the on the on the sea of glass now together before Jesus. Jesus, we trade in all our preconception. We trade in all our accusation. We trade in all our understanding and to say, we know nothing. Let's meet you again today. Let's fall in love with you again today. At rest, this is your idea. Be you. Be you, Jesus. Whoever you really are, we're going to love you for who you are. We know that you are Lord and you are Savior. That's a dispensation. What are you? Who are you? Before that, after that, forever, that person. We want to know. We want to see you. We want to become like you. We want to be evenly matched. So, Jesus, have your way. We want to acknowledge you as our king, as our high priest, as our brother. And we acknowledge all the elements of your kingdom. Father, Holy Spirit, seven spirits, the angels in all their domains, their estates, their authorities, their administration, the saints, ancient ones, those who stand by, men in white linen, all those who are known and loved and love the Father. We're all together. And I declare that we've entered the new covenant. We remember our sins no more. And no man need to teach us, but you will teach us ourselves. And the anointing within us continues to teach us. Father, I ask that today, wherever I come as, that I'll be reconciling man to God, that people would know you, know you, not about you, but know you, not your works, but your ways, your very person. And I ask that you would do that. And I acknowledge all the angels and all the, uh, the calls and the scrolls and all these people. And I'm very gentle. I'm very aware of these things. And I ask that it be administered. The kingdom would be administered to these people. And we'd all realize who we are already today. Okay. All right, everyone. Very good. Very good. So Joseph spoke yesterday, and I've got I've made some quick notes here. And he talked about will, the will of your will and God's will, and uh, God having a good, perfect, and pleasing will. So normally I do a show of hands of who knows me, but it's a little bit difficult now. But um, basically, in scripture. Of the good responses, there's always three, and they're both three good responses, and which I always present as 30, 60, 100, because it's easy to understand, and Jesus presented it that way. They use farming as an example so that people will know that forever. Let me just shift this over here. That people will, will, will know that forever. So, uh, back again. All right. So people will know that forever. Uh, everyone understands farming. Everyone understands seed, top, and harvest. It's in every culture of the earth. It's in every place of the earth. So we all know seed, top, and harvest. And Jesus was saying, it's the state of your soil, your heart, that makes it 30, 60, or 100. Because the seed is the same. And in this example, the seed is the word. The seed is the gospel. The seed is anything that God sets, his word. And it goes into your soil, which is your heart. We know it's your heart because Jesus says, the soul is your heart. So, job done. So, the soul goes into your heart, and then your, the quality of your heart determines what crop you get. Okay? It's about good soil. And all good soil is, is saying, how good is God? And so, for a very quick, easy frame up, 30, 60, 100. 30 to traditional church, 60 folds the Pentecostal charismatic church, and the 100 fold is mature sonship which we sometimes call mysticism. Uh, we're having trouble with that word, but for this sake of this conversation, we will know what we're talking about. And 30-fold is actually the same seed comes out that you've been born again and raised a seed in heavenly places as a son of God. And they say, fantastic. I receive that. I will see God in heaven. He's so good to me. He's taken my sins away and I will see him in heaven. And that's what they believe. And that's good. God is so good to do that. 
He hasn't abandoned us. He's not punishing us. He's taken it away, made us a new creature, and we'll see him in heaven. Threefold. He is that good, but no better. Sometimes he may perform a miracle. Sometimes he may intervene. But between now and then, we have the word. We have the word, read the Bible. When I say the word, I mean the physical book Bible. And we will make do. And God is a mystery. Sixtyfold says, no, no, God's better than that. Same seed, they get a better result. And they say, God's so much better than that. They send his Holy Spirit down to us from heaven, down to us. And he gives us anointings and giftings. And we can do ministry aspects of the ministry of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we can give words of knowledge. We can prophesy. He's that good. Now, the thief would say, hang on, he's not that good. Are you saying that you can prophesy? Are you saying that a Christian can heal someone? Like who you think you are? God? No, 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 no. We're not God. We've got a jacket, a gift that allows us to do these things. And the thief would say, he's not that good. The 60 fold said, no, he is that good. He allows me to prophesy. And so the 30-fold prophecy is blasphemous. You, a human, prophesying. And if you really don't believe me, just go on a deep dive on YouTube one day. You won't come out. You won't come out a better person. But you'll, I'll prove my point that there's a lot of people that say all prophecy and all word of knowledge is all deception. And because uh, God's not that good. And I don't trust the more invisible aspect, that more intangible, more subjective aspect of a gifting, okay, of a rima word now. That how can a Christian speak the heart of God? How can any human speak the heart of God? Yeah, that's God's desire. He's given them gifts to do these things, word of knowledge, uh, faith, miracles, healings, plural, whatever that means, all these things like that, tongues, tongues of angels, tongues of men as gifts that come down. He's that good, okay? And so if you're, if lots of us will come from Pentecostalism, we look at those default people, those evangelicals and go, come on guys, come up here. All right, have your way, do your thing. We're getting on with it because we've got it right. But we don't because that's just 60 fold. And then it's the hundred fold. And the 60 fold go, no, 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 God's not that good. <laughs> we go, yes, he is. Okay. And the hundred fold is, Everything that the 30-fold, and especially the 60-fold, believe they're working towards by good behavior, participating, waiting for anointings, waiting for moves of God, waiting for shiftings, waiting for the men of God, waiting for the next revival, as we keep changing, has already been given to us. We are already sons of God. We are already born again. We are already have the kingdom. The whole kingdom is within us. Everything we need for life and godliness has been given to us. Okay. So the threefold mainly are looking for right standing with God. That's why they do their things. Go to church a certain time, eat a certain thing, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Very behavior orientated. They want right standing before God. Well, we'll be made righteous forever. Been done. And the 60 fold are looking to change their anointing and their capacity to perform miracles, signs and wonders and and bring that heaven to earth in that way. And that's also already been given to us. Everything is yes and amen in Christ. Everything you need for life and godliness has been given to us. We are raised to see it in heavenly places. We can partake in the divine nature. We put on a new man that's created to be like God. It's already given to us. Everything the church is trying to achieve, we already are as a gift when you believed, not when you repented. Not when you change your clothes, not when you stop smoking, not when you stop drugs, not when you stop gambling, not when you start going to church, not when you started tithing, not when you understood about the courts, not when you understood about angels, none of those things. It's already given to you straight away on the day you're born again. You're young, a baby in the metaphoric sense, but the whole kingdom is yours and it's your new nature. You'll be given a new nature. And this new nature is righteous. So you're born a human and you don't have to do anything to be a human. You're just human. You don't suddenly become a cat or a giraffe or a dog. You're human. You have human nature and it is what it is. Okay. Well, the Bible says, don't you know that when you were baptized in the cross, you were baptized into his death and the same spirit or power that raised Jesus from the dead also rose you from the dead. So you can participate in the same resurrection life he does. Okay. So when you became a Christian, you received, when you received Christ, when you believed, when you received the word, 
what was given to you mystically that you on the cross with Jesus went down with him. You came up with him. This is given to you. Okay. You didn't feel it. You didn't feel the thing of death. He did it. Went down up. You died with him. He rose as him, as he is. You rose as Christ, a new being, a son of God. You are now a son of God. You didn't change belief systems. You didn't change religions. You changed species. You were a human, and now you are a son of God. A son of God is a class of being. Angels are a class of being. Angels are different classes of beings. The father is a class of being. You are a class of being. The class of being that you are is a son of God. First Adam was a living being. That's what you were. Last Adam, second Adam, us, Adam 2.0, is a life-giving spirit. That's what you are now. You're a life-giving spirit. because You're attached to life only. You're from life. You have a new DNA and is divine because the Father literally fathered you. In the same way they created the earth, the same way he incarnated the Christ, the word, into Jesus. So creation, he hovered over the waters. The spirit hovered over the waters. Hover, hover, hover. He sent his word, his seed, his word, same thing, into that and formed creation. He hovered over Mary. The spirit hovered over Mary. She received the word. Hovered over her waters, received the word. Jesus is created. God undiluted into man, undiluted. Fully God, fully man. A new class of being. God and man together. Heaven and earth has come together. Eden, the Garden of Eden, was heaven and earth together. The Ark of the Covenant in there, inside the Holy of Holies, was heaven and earth coming together, but shielded. In Mary, her womb, which is the Ark, was uh, heaven and earth together. Then Jesus came out and he was heaven, heaven and earth together. Jesus was heaven and earth together in a person, fully God, fully man, a new class of being forever. Yeah. And now when you receive the word, the Holy Spirit hovers over you, you don't know anything. The word comes like it's coming now. You receive the word of salvation, the word of being born again, what Christ has done for you. You receive it, it goes into you, and you are born again from above. You're a new creation. What exists now never existed before. And this new being that you are is born of heaven. It's from heaven. It belongs in heaven. It has heaven's DNA. And the DNA it has given you is righteousness, is holiness is sanctification this is your dna so if i was, if i'm a human i rob a bank i'm still human if i'm if i'm a human and i work for orphans i'm still human okay if i'm divine if i'm righteous and i'm holy and i rob a bank i'm still divine righteous and holy it's my dna if i am a son of god and i work in an orphanage it doesn't change my righteousness if I'm a son of God that gives the poor, it doesn't change my righteousness. If I'm a son of God and I don't tithe, do tithe. If I do forgive my mom, don't forgive my mom. It doesn't matter. I'm still righteous. It's my DNA. I can't change my DNA. It is righteous forever. It is the eternal, imperishable, immortal, uncorruptible seed of Christ himself. Because Christ is my righteousness. 1 Corinthians 1. Christ has become for us wisdom that is our righteousness, our holiness, our sanctification. So Christ is my holiness. I don't have holiness. I'm not holy. I didn't receive holiness. When I received Christ, I didn't become holy. That's not the mechanism I'm saying. The mechanism is I didn't become holy. The mechanism is I received the person of Jesus Christ, and he's my holiness. Whatever I do, it doesn't change what he's done. Whatever I do doesn't change his nature. Whatever I do doesn't change his behavior. He is holy forever. And so I'm holy forever. Forever. Because that is my holiness, the person of Christ. And he's my righteousness, my right standing with God. Christ is my right standing with God. 
he has fulfilled the law by heart and by word. So this morning, before you got out of bed, you have healed the sick, you've raised the dead, you've defended women's rights, you've resisted sin unto death, you said, not my will, but yours. <laughs> you took the sin of the world upon you. You've, uh, you've done four miracles. You are righteous forever. That righteousness has been given to you. It is finished. He did it before the foundation. He brought it to earth in this time. So forever in eternity and on earth in this time, you are righteous forever because it's your DNA. Your DNA is God's DNA. So you can boldly go into heaven in your time of need. Why? Because that's where you're from. That's your DNA. When you go see God, he's looking at himself. He's looking at his own righteousness. He's looking at his own holiness. First Adam, in the image of God, looking at each other's image. Second Adam, the very image of God. You are the very image of God. This has been given to you. This is your nature, a son of God, a son of God. That's what you are forever. And all we're doing is changing our, our, what we believe in our heart so that crop comes out. How do you believe that in your heart? Well, you hear it. As you're hearing it now, it's changing your soil. It's that easy because it must be a rest that no man can boast. It must be a gift. A, a professor now, a, a milkmaid from the 1200s that has six kids and works 12-hour days, uh, in the north of Norway, where it's dark for twelve months, the, for twelve months, for for two months of the year, she can become a fully manifest son of God on earth by hearing a word. How she get that word? Maybe from the scripture. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word, Reba. And it could be from a, a dream, it could be from a prophet, it could be, could be from a visitation, it could be from the observation of nature but God will bring her word, 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 word. And the word becomes frequency, which becomes particle. So she can see it in the trees. She can see it in her children. She can see it in uh, nature, or she can hear it in her heart, or she can hear it from the word. She gets to church uh, maybe, you know, 12 times a year because she has to drive in carts through the snow to get there. Can this person that can only get to church 12 times a year become a fully manifest son of God on earth? Of course. Because the new covenant is, I'll remember your sins no more, and I will teach you myself. No man needs to teach you, okay? And it's your response to these things. So she is a a righteous person as much as I'm a righteous person, as much as anyone's received Christ, because Christ is our righteousness. So righteousness is your DNA. So I just want to read you Ephesians, Ephesians 1. Okay. Ephesians 1, verse 3 onwards. Blessed be the... I'll do it this way, so I'm not off mic. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. You know all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. Okay, there's enough in that for your whole life. But first I want to point out is that before the foundation of the world, by all wisdom, by all understanding, so by all perfection, this is the perfect loving understanding that he chose you before the foundation to be holy and blameless in his sight forever. And you've achieved that. It's done. He did it. The work he set out to do, he's done. You are holy and blameless in his sight forever in love. In love. In love, he predestined you. Well, some say you're holy and blameless in the beloved. He chose this. He worked it out beforehand. He paid the price beforehand with Jesus slain before the foundation of the world. The word lamb slain before the foundation of the world. 
He brought it to this time that you in this body, in this time, in physically on the earth, are righteous and holy and blameless forever. It's done. Why? It's given to you as DNA, your new DNA. And your new DNA is the very spirit of Christ. Because you're a spirit being. Your DNA is the spirit of the Lord. And that spirit of the Lord is your nature. It is your substance. It's your core reality. And you can't change that. So you are the spirit of the Lord. That's your DNA. Because if man be in Christ, he's one spirit with the Lord. You're one spirit. One spirit with the Lord. That's what you are. Forever. And this one spirit gives you all the attributes of the Father. Now, <laughs> so what I'm speaking about is qualifying you in your heart by understanding, just by hearing this word. All you have to do is hear the word. That's all you're doing. Hearing the word, faith comes by hearing. Okay? Because Joseph is talking about expressing your will and reigning on the earth in this body. Okay? Now and forever, but starting now. So the reason why you can do all these things that Joseph is talking about, these divine things, these things that 30-fold and 60-fold would say, yes, you can do that when you die. Of course, when you die, you can look at stars, you can create things, you can make substance by your own, expressing your own will. You can do these things. Of course you can when you die. Well, that means your physical death, which is the curse of Eden, allows you to access the kingdom. But it's not. It's Christ's physical death that allows you to access the kingdom. So all the things that you got taught in Sunday school or church or whatever, that when you die, maybe you can do this. You can do it. You can do it now. And what Joseph is teaching us is how to mature, become a person that God allows to have such things. because. A baby, a child, when he is young, even though he owns the whole estate, is under tutors and governors. Why? To teach him to become a person that can manage the estate. So a baby owns the whole estate. He's inherited the whole estate. But he can't drive the tractor. He can't, <laughs> he can't drive the car. He can't go to the bank and make transactions. It's beyond his comprehension. He has never seen this world before. Well, we, he doesn't know how the father runs the house. He doesn't have the ability to know how the father runs the house, but grow up into that. Well, that's what we're doing. The exact same thing. Okay, we're new. We're a baby in that we're new. We're a neophyte. We're not babies, but we're new to this kingdom in that we're remembering it. And as we know the father, we learn what he's like. And the father wants to give it to us. Okay, so there are Americans that the government will give them the keys to a tank and a machine gun. And that's your machine gun. That's your tank. We're supplying it for you. You have access to it at all times. And they're 20 years old. There's 20-year-olds in America. The government says you can have this tank because they use the tank in the same way the government would use the tank. They use that machine gun in the exact same way the government wants them to use the machine gun. They can have access to it. There are 40-year-olds in America that the government says, you can't drive a car. You're banned from driving a car because you don't use that car in the way that we want you to use the car. Use it in an invalid way, a dangerous way. They're both American citizens. One can have a tank. They use it in the way the kingdom uses tanks. And one uh, can't have a car. It's not to do with their age. It's not to do with their citizenship. It's to do with, will they use these assets in the same way the kingdom uses the assets? And you too, if you have children, you have one son, you have two sons, you love them both. And one son just wants to do what you say. Like if you said that, that means something to him. And he treats your resources, your assets in the same way you would treat them, according to his capacity. So if you teach him uh, and you know that he will use your things with the same heart that you would use those things, then you can trust him with it, even though you know he's going to damage them. That's okay. It will damage him. Not a problem. You've, you're mentally prepared for this. You're the father. Okay. You've got this under control. And so when he's 18, 
he can have the keys to the car because he will use that car with the same heart and intent that you would use the car. Will he crash it? Yeah, probably. But the heart and intent is right and you're prepared to grow him into maturity so he can drive his own car one day. You have another son, he doesn't really care what you say. Not really. It doesn't really bother him. It doesn't really, he sort of does it sometimes. Sometimes he does it half-hearted. And sometimes if he can get away with it, he'll use your resources according to his desires, not your desire. Yep. <laughs> so when he's 18, you love him the same. You just can't give him the car. He's not like you. He's not going to use your the car the same way you'd use the car. And so it's not safe to give him the car. It's not safe for society. It's not safe for him. It's not safe for the assets of the household. Both sons you love the same. One can have the car. One can't have the car. So what we're doing now is we are learning what the father is like and we're becoming like him so that we can uh, govern his assets on the earth in this body now. Okay. So two very important things. Beloved son of God and be like your father. Okay, let's start with beloved son of God. So we're new creations. And the church understands it in different ways. Threefold, yeah, we're new creations. That means when we die, we go to heaven. Sixtyfold, yeah, we're new creations. That means we get gifts. Jackets come down and we get to use the gifts for a while. And hundredfold is new creations that we have the absolute divine nature right now. We can start walking like God, talking like God, acting like God, behaving like God. Like, like a little kid will pretend to be like his dad. A little kid, you, you wash the car and the three-year-old comes out, wants to wash the car too. Yep, that's what we're doing. You get your little, your dad mows the lawn and then little kid gets his little fake plastic lawn mower, mows the lawn, okay? He's learning to be like his father in heaven. His father on earth. We're learning to be like our father in heaven. And that's exactly the same way we learn. We look at him, we copy him. He gives us little safe environments to copy him. And then we get more and more until we can actually have his gear. And we can have that in the body now. It's our DNA. We're just maturing to become like him. Okay. So threefold, does that will happen one day? Sixtyfold says we get jackets. We can do little bits of it. If you know, we work the anointing or wait for the anointing to come or revival comes or we get a gifting. Okay. Hundredfold says it's not, it's not the jackets because the jackets are for carnal people. Giftings are for the carnal church. Remember that. And I'm carnal, okay? I've got carnality in me somewhere. And so I am not killing everyone. So I need the jacket. I use this as my anointing. The anointing comes down, Whoa, sits on me like this, okay? And now I can heal people, okay? But it's not me. It's not my DNA, okay? Because I don't yet believe that, that DNA. I've never seen it. My soul has no record of it. So I get a jacket. This jacket helps me, to, helps me to heal people. I heal this person, I heal that person. And this is teaching me what my DNA can do. It's teaching me to be a son of God. Now I've got a jacket and this lets me heal people or prophesy. It doesn't change me. It doesn't change my character. So I can heal people for love. I can heal people, heal people for money. I can heal people out of pressure. I, have, I can heal people because I don't like myself. And I think if I heal people, God would like me. It doesn't change my character. It doesn't make me more love. It doesn't make me like God. It's just a jacket. In the same way, if you've got a hammer, it doesn't make you a good person or a bad person. A good person with a hammer might build a house. A bad person with a hammer might break into a house. It's just a tool, okay? So we look at anointed gifted people and they mess up when they fall. Well, that's because the anointing and the jackets have got nothing to do with character. They're just gifts, like you can get a hammer. Someone gave, gives you a hammer, okay? But this is to teach me what it's like to be a son of God. The same way training wheels on a bicycle, you ride a bicycle, you put training wheels on those bicycles. Okay, so your little kid's riding a bicycle with training wheels. This is my training wheels. This is how to be divine training wheels. I can get words of knowledge here. I can have knowledge about people and going around. Okay, if you've got training wheels, are you riding a bike? Yes, but no. But yeah, you are riding the bike, but no, you're not. But yeah, you are, but you're not really. Okay, so one day, if you're going to really ride the bike, you got to give the gifts back. Training wheels come off. I cried. I remember when my dad took my training wheels off my bike and I didn't want him to. I was crying. I cried. I didn't want him to do it. Okay. And so this is what many people in ministry do. They cry. <laughs> you got to take the training wheels off and then you get a bit worse. <laughs> You're worse than what you were before. The training wheels have gone. And eventually, now you really are riding a bike and exponential what you can do from there. Okay. Gifts come off. 
This is what it's like to be a son of God. I can heal people. I can prophesy. I can have works of faith. Comes off. And instead of having external things helping me, it's myself now that's becoming a son of God. Okay? A son of God. And that's the shifting from the 60-fold to the 100-fold. And many people in the 60-fold know this, and they want to be a, they're a son of God. They say so son of God has absolute authority at all times, and they use it for ministry, 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 ministry. And they have this beautiful 100-fold understanding that's expressed in the earthly state of working, ministry, servant-like, and they burn out. And they burn out, and it's devastating because there's no theology left. And once you're perfect, once you have all authority, once you're like Christ, and once you're living by the spirit of your DNA and you can just heal off your DNA, they burn out. And, and then what? that's the disaster. So, for example, this is how powerful just understanding new creation is. Alexander Dowie, who restored healing to the whole church, he was, in, was near Adelaide, they moved to Sydney, and uh, the plague came through, and all these people in his congregation started dying. And he was so angry with God, he got his Bible, he threw it against the wall. <laughs> and then of that era, he's like, oh, sorry for the Bible. He went to the Bible, and he saw a verse about sicknesses from the devil. And he was like, the devil? Sickness is the devil? I can kick it out. And that's where healing came back. And he moved to America, up Zion, outside Chicago. That was the healthiest place on earth. Yep. And they had healing, 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 healing. And he restored healing to the church. Okay. Was he baptized in the Holy Spirit? No, not at all. He thought the baptism of the Holy Spirit was the devil. And when the Holy Spirit people came through, he had signs around Zion, no tongues here, no, no devil babble here. Okay. The grass healer, they restored healing to the church. Just out of his new creation, no gifting, no jacket. He refused them. I don't want your giftings. I want your jackets. He actually thought that they were a deception. And just out of his new creation, killed everyone. And then taught others to heal. Yep. But he burnt out, went into deception, and thought he was Elijah that was to come, and crashed and burnt. His protege was called John G. Lake. Uh, John G. Lake also had a lot of pain in his childhood and lost, like, I think, seven brothers, sisters. I think he saw seven of his siblings die. So he hated death. And he went and studied under, John, under Alexander Dowie. Also, didn't believe in the Holy Spirit. And he went around healing everyone, the most successful healer of all time. Not only that, he taught others to do it. If you came to him, he wouldn't heal you. He, you he'd teach you what, how to heal, and then he, he wouldn't teach you anymore until you started healing, until it became practice in your life, and you saw the authority. And it's all based with your union with Christ. No gifts, no healings, no tongues, nothing. He didn't believe it was real. He only received the baptism of the Holy Spirit late in his ministry. So what happened to him? Well, his first wife died. People think of absolute collapse and exhaustion. And all the children in that first marriage didn't go on with God. Got married again. With a different understanding. That marriage lasted. Those children went on with God. So you can be a new creation. You can have mystic theology. You can know about the courts. You can know about the garden, you can know about the orchard, you can know about all the dimensions, you can know about the four faces of God, you can know about all these things, you can know in the same way these guys knew about ministry, and you can still burn out, you can still crash and burn you, it just becomes more information, okay, so what, what is the missing piece? Matthew says, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. You are, this DNA that you are, this new creation that you are, is the beloved son. He predestined you to be holy and blameless in his sight forever in the beloved. Or in love, he predestined you by all wisdom and knowledge. In love. You're from love, you're made out of love, and you are loved. Because your DNA is divine. That DNA never changes. You are love. What is the beloved? How, what is the beloved? The beloved is the object of someone's affections. It has nothing to do with your actions. It has nothing to do with your attitude. It's to do with some inherent nature that you have. Your inherent nature is lovable. 
as Brendan Manning says, and Brendan Manning was a priest that ended up in absolute poverty and drunkenness. And the people would find the, the priest drunk on the ground in the city square. And obviously he lost all his position, everything like that. And one day, you can follow his story. He found that God loved him as a drunk, awful, broken priest that failed in every area. And he says, in loving me, I knew I was lovable. Okay? Because it's him that's lovable. Not his drunkenness or lack of, not his ability to be a priest or lack of him, the new creation. In being loved, you are lovable. In God loving you, it shows that you are lovable. What does he love? His very self. You are his child. He just loves you. In the same way, in the best sense, the best parent has a child and they love, they look at that baby and they love that baby. Why does that love that baby? What has it done? What hasn't it done? Has it done good things? Has it done bad things? They don't care. They just love the baby. It's them. It's of them. They love it. Just of its inherent value of its being the child. And they gaze upon it. Okay? So, so do we. So it says God to us. He loves us. We are his very DNA. We are the beloved son. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. This new create that, that thing that Jesus is, is what we, our new creation. That's what we are. We are the beloved son in whom God is well pleased. And that's from day one. No ministry, no miracles, nothing like that from your existence. The beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You are the object of love. How do you know you're the beloved? Well, how do you know if you're loved? You can only sit and observe. That's the only thing you can do. No action, no change, will qual- that will qualify you for it. But you need to be beloved of your own existence. Yeah? Just by your own being, your inherent worth, your inherent nature is of itself lovable, is of itself loved. You're the beloved. You are the beloved. And you, so God looks at you of your inherent worth has all his affection and attention towards you. This is the rest. We understand we're righteous, nothing to do, holy, nothing to change, and beloved. I'm righteous forever in the beloved. I'm holy forever in the beloved. I'm perfected for eternity in the beloved. It's done. What is the work that God requires for us? What, what does God require us to do to do the works of God? Ask Jesus. Jesus says, the work that God requires of you is to believe in the one who be sent. Do you believe in the one who be sent? You do? Well, your work is done. If you believe, your work is done. Because in that moment, before you change, you receive the new nature. You receive the free gift that no one can boast. The free gift of a new nature. Died with him, rose as him. In Christ, you are Christ. You are as you ought to be. The holy thing, the righteous thing, <laughs> the level thing you're, you're trying to change and learn about to become, you already are. If you listen to Joseph's teachings or Ian's teachings or, 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 or Dr. O teaching or anyone else's teachings, Justin's teachings, to get that thing that will qualify you to go to the heavens or to receive a healing, or whatever your thing is, you've left the new birth and you've returned to works. Paul says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Why are you acting like Satan? Why are you under a curse? How did you receive the Holy Spirit and have miracles amongst you or the new birth? By believing or behaving? It's by believing. So I'm receiving miracles, signs and wonders in the Holy Spirit, so the benefits of the kingdom, by believing why have you gone back to behaving to maintain it? If you could maintain these things by behaving, then Christ died for nothing. It's in believing that you were born again, a beloved son of God. Not son of God, that's the God, because remember, the farmer had two sons. They were both sons of the farmer. Not, neither knew they were loved. The thing that the two sons had in common Neither of them knew that they were loved by the Father. 
So one thought, the father's not good to me, and I go get my own. The other one thought, the father's not good to me, I'm going to work hard in the garden. They both didn't know they were loved. And the beloved son is telling the story. Jesus, you are loved. You're holy and righteous forever. All the things that you wanted to achieve by going to church, by changing your life, by going to conferences, by learning new things, to qualify yourself, are all nonsense. They're all religion. They're all the doctrines of demons. <laughs> They're all the knowledge, tree of knowledge of good and evil, which always leads to death. Because all these things that you think you need to do uh, are by our knowledge of what's right and wrong. If you don't know you have it, you're righteous, you're holy, you're sanctified, you're the beloved son of God. If you don't know this, if you don't you've got it, you will do something to get it. As simple as that. Adam and Eve, they're going to be fathered into being sons of God that um, govern the universe. And then the devil says, do you really have that? Would God really give that to you? Is he that good? What's your soil saying? And a word came, and that word took root in their soil. They didn't believe God was good. And so they reached for something, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, to qualify themselves to be like God, as opposed to being qualified by being born of God. Well, you're born of God, and so you're qualified. You are the beloved son of God. Beloved. Be at peace. Just your nature, just sitting here right now, is your loved. And uh, if you want to. I address this in a sermon called The Still Face God, S T I L L, The Still Face God, which is on YouTube. Or there's a series uh, un, from, under Azir's Ministries on YouTube called The Activate Wow, Activate uh, VUMC series. And it goes through this, there's four sermons. But the point is, God loves you now. So Matthew starts This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Yep. And at the end of Matthew, it says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And listen to him means he has the father's authority. And that's what we're doing. Now the church wants the father's authority without being the beloved son. If you don't know you've got it, you'll do something to get it. And all church activity is the behavior they're doing to get God's approval to have his authority in a certain area. Whatever their thing is, whatever they love, whatever they want revival, they want miracles, they want church growth, they want healing, they want successful ministry, they want good marriages, they want to, whatever. They want, even though God's pleased with them, they don't know they have it, they're doing something to get it. They're moving this way. Mm, 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 mm. But you're born again. You're perfect already in, in heaven, already perfect, moving this, uh, and you bring that down. The thing the church is trying to get by the works of the flesh, which leads to death, you have by the spirit at rest, by your new nature, born again, divine DNA, which is the very spirit of God, and that nature you're releasing. And as you become like him, you release it. And how you become like him? By getting to know him, spending time with him, hearing his word, you changed. And it was his idea before the foundation of the world, that he's doing it. Why? You're the beloved son. If you say to God, as the beloved son, which you are, in whom he's well pleased already, you walk in, he sees you, he sees himself in you, you're the very image, not in the image, the very image of God. You go and see him, you say, Dad, I want to be like you. And I want to take care of the family business when I grow up. I want to be exactly like you. I want to govern creation like you govern creation. Father's like, really? I couldn't, you couldn't compliment me higher. That's all I want? You want to be like me? Then all my resources are there. And I know how to take you like me, and you like me, and you like me. Yep, I know how to make all you like me. You were from a poor family in Korea. You were from a rich family in Sweden. You had a religious upbringing. You've got 20 generations of uh, murder and violence. You've got four generations of Pentecostal pastors. None of that's an object to me. <laughs> I can take every single one of you and make you a fully manifest son of God on earth. I can do it. 
is my desire. Before the foundation of the world, I laid the resource, the platform for this, the blood of Christ, sanctifies everything, a new creation. And all I'm going to get you to do is believe it in your heart that I would do that for you. What's the law we all believe? God's good to everyone, just not me. God loves the world. He doesn't like me. God performs miracles for people, but just not for me. And because you don't know you've got it, you will do something to get it. If you can't do it, you run away like a younger kid. If you can do it, you go work hard in the field. Both is wrong. You receive it out of this new birth. Died with him, rose as him, our beloved son of God. This beloved son of God, this baby, God wants you to take over the whole estate. That's his desire. It was his desire. He, before the foundation of the world, uh, he predestined good works in advance for you to do. Before he knew, formed you in the womb, he knew you. This was his desire. And he's going to cause you to will and act according to his good purpose. You can't even do that. You can't even respond. The spirit in you, your new DNA, that nature comes up. He causes you to will and to act according to his good purpose. When he started, he is faithful to finish. Even your heart condemns you. He's greater than your heart. You don't have to believe you're good enough. You don't have to believe anything. It's based on his character. And that Ephesians verse I'm going to read again at the end, it's all about him, his idea, by his power, by his wisdom. He decided to give you his kingdom. And you just have to receive it. Can you receive a gift? If you can receive a gift, believe it, that is the opposite of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You're undoing Eden. But if you don't know, you're going to get it. Either he's not that good, did God really say, or you're not that good. If you are the son of God, the only two lies that there are. If you, if you, if you take his word over that reasoning, then you, it, it will happen. You, that's already your nature. And the word that's in you, the, sort, the, the, the seed that's in you, will grow a crop of a hundredfold. And the hundredfold crop is the nature of God expressed in the body on the earth, from heaven down. This is my son to become, this is my, this is my son, this is my beloved son, and whom I'm well pleased, done. We're all sons, we're all loved by our nature. Become, this is my son, and whom I'm well pleased, listen to him. 30, 60, 100. Good. 30, pleasing, 60, 100, perfect. Or some translations say acceptable. And we hear that in the English word, in English mind, acceptable, good, pleasing, acceptable. No, acceptable is um, temple language, the acceptable sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, Christ. Acceptable is a, a sacrificial term. So some say good, pleasing, and perfect. The translators say perfect. So it makes sense in English. It goes up, up, up. The acceptable sacrifice is to die and rise again. So be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You really got it? So be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12. And it comes out what you already have. Knowing you've already got it. And then you will know the good, pleasing, acceptable will of God. And the acceptable, which is the perfect, is to be the risen Christ in the body. How do we know that? It says you died with him, you rose as him, and you can participate in the same resurrection life he has. As John says, as he is, so you now on the earth. As he is. And remember, John saw him as he is. John saw Jesus as he is. At the end of his life, John 1 written right at the end, maybe 90 AD. He's saying, as he is. So are you now on the earth. Find your eyes, sword in your mouth, long white hair, golden belt or girdle, brass feet, voice like rushing waters. You're like Jesus. The devil knows, God knows, heaven knows. There's only one person that has a question, and that's you. And if you don't even got it, you will do something to get it. And that will be religion. And that religion disqualifies you. Because if you achieve it, you go into pride. And if you don't achieve it, you go into condemnation. It's the lose-lose tree. You're using the very thing that got you kicked out of the garden to try and get back in the garden. You're using the thing that Jesus got nailed to to get back in there. Don't do it. You can only receive it as a gift. This great, exceeding, precious thing that we've, we've, we've received. Okay? It's the new nature. The new nature. So, that was, and the other one was, 
the nature of the Father. So, what is this thing? What is this thing? This maturity to become? Do I have to learn about all the stars? Do I have to learn about the, the levels of the angels? Do I need to be able to meet Enoch and go on a, a tour of the wine room? Do I um, need to operate in this court of the kings, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? These are all great things. But the answer is you need to become like your father in heaven. Because if you like him and you act like he act, you can have what he's got, same as us. Okay? Now, if only there was a way that we'd know what the father would be like on earth. Can anyone think of one? <laughs> so Jesus was the exact representation of the father. We know what God would do if he came to earth. Because he came to earth. The son did exactly what he saw the father doing. We know. And not only that, Jesus spoke it out in words. Okay? And so the Sermon on the Mount describes the nature of the kingdom. Not the New Covenant, not the Old Covenant, not the Davidic Covenant, not the Mosaic Covenant, the kingdom. And from before Genesis and after Revelation, it goes forever. And the kingdom looks like the Father. He's describing it. Now, the 30-fold and the 60-fold who don't know they've got it already, they don't believe God's that good. They say they look at the Sermon on the Mount as a series of things to attain to. But it's not. The Sermon on the Mount describes you. It's describing the nature that you already are as a free gift, born again. Forgiveness is your nature. A peacemaker is your nature. Humility is your nature. Um, what's that one? Meek. Meekness is your nature. And meekness means bridled strength. That's what it means. It means have the ability to act, to bring judgment, to bring force, and to choose not to. That's your nature. You have the nature of the Father. Your nature is you do what he would do. Okay? And Jesus says, and walk the extra mile, turn the other cheek, give to those who steal from you, give more. Okay? Because that's what God does. That's what your father does. Your father gives to those who steal from him. Your, that's what the kingdom does. And Jesus says, if you do these things, you will, be, you will be like your father in heaven, who stands reign on the good and the evil, the just and the unjust. If you do these things, you will be like your father in heaven, who says reign on the good and the evil, the just and the unjust. That's what your father does. He says, reign on good people and evil people. He says, reign on the just and the unjust. He is good. Kindness leads to repentance. That's his base. Does he judge? Oh, yes. But only to protect the next generations. We can see that over and over again. That's you. That's your true nature. Some translations say, if you do these things, you'll be a true son of God. <laughs> you will become like your father in heaven. Who sends rain on the good and the evil? That's the change. Because if you have the knowledge of good and evil, you'll make a judgment by that knowledge. So what I have here. So if I, uh, by the knowledge of good and evil, by church life, which is by the knowledge of good and evil, not kingdom life, uh, Christians build the church, sons of God bring the kingdom. Okay. So Christians, I'm building a church and I have these resources. Okay. And of this resource, let's say it's $100. And there's someone who runs an orphanage and some drunk guy has left his wife and he's lost his money at the casino. So, good steward, where does this $100 go to? Well, what would the church give it to? Let's make it easier on ourselves. It goes to the orphanage. That's great stewardship. But God says reign on the good and the evil, the just and the unjust. Is that what the heaven's doing? We have no idea what heaven's doing. We have a knowledge of good and evil. We know that guy doesn't deserve the $100, and that guy does. Correct. It's not about deserving. It's about what is the kingdom doing? What is the nature of the Father? Is heaven any choice? Yep. It's about will. Do you have a choice? Maybe heaven's given $100 to the guy in the gutter. And when you change that guy in the gutter, maybe thousands of people come to Christ. Or not. Maybe God just wants that guy to have $100. Maybe God doesn't want that guy who's drunk in the gutter to sleep somewhere tonight. 
And he will never accept Christ. And he will never, he will be angry at God his whole life. And God wants him to have $100 so he can sleep in the bed tonight. That's the kingdom. I'm not going to use $100 that way. Ah, oh, you won't use resources the same way I use my resources? Then you can't have my resources. Guys are talking about forming objects from crea- creating with word and intent by the will. Uh, governing stars, changing creation. Everything reproduces after its own kind. If you won't give that guy $100, then you have judgment in you. And the universe that you create is going to have that judgment in its fabric. So God can't give you a universe. Does he love you? Yes. You're his beloved son. And he wants to give this to you. He just can't. He wants to give you the hammer, but he can't because he knows with that hammer, you can do something stupid with it. He knows you're going to do it. My friend's son, uh, um, uh, I wanted to give him a carpentry set one day. I thought, but he just doesn't do what he's told. I just couldn't give it to him. I saw it in the shop. I went, that guy. I oh, know it's his birthday. I want to give him this carpenter set, like a little saw, a little hammer. Because I got one when I was well, that age when I was a kid. Because my grandpa was a carpenter. I want to be a carpenter. And I thought, I'm going to give this guy a carpentry set. And I knew he's not going to use it the way I intended it. So he just can't have it. But I loved him. I want him to have it. But I just can't give it to him. Yeah. God's the same. Well, you won't give $100 to the drunk guy? The guy in jail? How about the guy who just murdered one of your family? That's impossible. So it's a miracle. You can't do it. Don't even try. But the nature within you can do it. Because the nature of God in you bleeds on behalf of the guilty, lays its life down for the very ones attacking him in that moment. Free forgiveness before the foundation of the world. And we see that this is the maturity all through Scripture. Moses, Abraham, pleaded on behalf of Solomon and Gomorrah. That he can be a father, the father of the faith. Because he pleaded on behalf of the guilty. That's God's nature. God's like, that's me. That's the kingdom. Um, Abraham, but Moses, that was Abraham. Moses. Let the Israelites out, and they're all grumpy. They're all angry. They're doing naughty stuff. And God says, I'm going to wipe out these Israelites, these descendants of Abraham. I'm starting with you, Moses. Moses is going to be the father of the faith. Moses is going to be, is going to be the great father. The, the nation that sees Christ is going to be the nation of Moses, the sons of Moses. I'm starting again. And Moses says, I'd rather I was written out of the book of life and the Jews get saved. So God's saying they're so naughty, and they were naughty. They were doing terrible, terrible things, trading, beings, alchemy, naughty stuff. Moreover, even worse, they were rejecting God's nature, saying he's not that good. We'll do it ourselves. The sin of Adam and Eve, they're doing the same thing again. And God says, I'm going to wipe them out and start with you, Moses. I'm giving my whole kingdom, my whole lineage to you. You're the father of salvation on the earth. And Moses says, I'd rather you kick me out and kept the Israelites. That's a miracle. That's the nature of the father within him. Paul says of the Israelites in Hebrews, uh, in Romans, he says, I'd rather I was written out of the book of life, if that be possible, that they be saved. Now, if you know the consequences of being written out of the book of life, there's no way you can honestly say that. I can't say that. I honestly don't care or love anyone that way. If someone's there and God says, will you trade places of your first estate and everything you're returning to and giving your whole life for, that this person, that this drunk person that just rammed into your car and killed your child, would you give it to him? No. There's no way. There's no way. It has to be a miracle. It's a new nature. You can't attain that. No matter of Bible reading, no matter of fasting, it's a new nature. The new nature in you would. Your new nature would plead, Father, that person that's just taken away everything I love, I will give give him my whole inheritance that he would know that he is loved. 
I'd rather forego it and give it to him. And of course, we see it in Jesus on the cross as they're killing him, as they're mocking him, as they're causing him physical and emotional pain. He says, forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. I'm going to exchange me for them. And also we see Enoch when and pleaded on behalf of the angels, the fallen angels as well. This is who you are. If you're like that, it means you've left the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because by the knowledge of good and evil, that guy that's hit my car, he doesn't deserve it. Those Israelites don't deserve it. These Roman soldiers and the, and the Levites and the Sadducees, the Pharisees stabbing Jesus, not him, not him to a cross, they don't deserve it. But deserve? That's a tree of knowledge of good issue. That's gone. You are a trillion years in the future to give a human understanding. Loved, love forever. Everything's been given to you. You don't need to win. You have it. You have it already. You're the beloved son in whom he's well pleased. Now become like the father who says, reign on the good and evil, the just and the unjust. Leave the knowledge of good and evil behind. It's your true nature. Let it come out. Now consider the cost before building a tower. You can choose to be 30-fold, and that's a great return. You're in paradise forever. Awesome. You can be choose to be 60-fold. That's great. You'll get to govern some stuff in heaven. You can choose to be a hundredfold. But 30 folds baptism of water, you're in. 60 folds baptism of the spirit, do stuff, ministry. 100 folds baptism of fire, changing your very DNA, refine that DNA into the same sword flame frequency that lets you go back into Eden, in Eden any time. Divine nature, DNA, divine nature assimilated, achieved whatever, and God, if you decide to do that, then God will happily bring about circumstances upon the earth where you choose by the act of your will that is God that, did God really say? Yes, he did. Was he that good to you? Are you the son of God? Yes, he is. By believing his word, that'll be my next sermon this afternoon, by believing his word, his word alone, that it manifests. Leave the seed. And if I say, I believe, good soil, it comes forth and let the visible word do it. Why would he do that for you? You're the beloved son of God. And as you see the the spirit work for you, you don't need it. I've got it. You don't need to do anything together. I don't need to use scarce resources well. And I leave judgment behind. God says, you're laying your life down for the person that hurt you the most. And God will give you the opportunity. That's what I would do. You're like me. You can have the tank. <laughs> you can have the machine gun. You can govern the universe because you would lie your life down like I would for that universe and all the mistakes they're going to make. Before the foundation, before it starts, before you make that bar of gold, before you heal that knee, before you would ever, you would lay your life down for it because you're like me. You're like me, you can have what I have. Will you crash it? Yes, but I'm going to pay for it because I see your heart. This beloved son, and whom well pleased. Okay, that's the whole new creation thing we're talking about. Born again, new DNA. Loved, lovable, holy, righteous forever. Okay, and then to become the beloved son, and whom I'm well pleased, listen to him, authority, become like him. How do we know what he's like? We have the exact representation of the Father, Christ, his life. And if you don't understand the stories, he preached it in the sermon. <laughs> If you do these things, you'll be like your father in heaven. And if you like that and you lay your life down for people, then you can also bring some pretty strong actions too, like Jesus turned over tables, et cetera. Okay. So you're not a doormat. The fact you would lay your life down for him means that you can make life or death decisions, and, and Paul certainly did. Okay. So I'm going to just read you this verse again, and that's it. So I'm going to read. Ephesians 3 again, no, Ephesians 1, 3. And we just listen to it again and just listen to how it's all based on him. It was his idea. He has done it. Done. And what he's done is exceedingly great. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Translations is awesome. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ, past tense, with every spiritual blessing 
in heavenly places where we are. Even as he chose us in him, when, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love, he predestined us to be holy and blameless before him, or he done. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Christ Jesus, according to the purpose of his will. He chose it. The praise of his glorious grace, his glorious grace, in which he has blessed us in the beloved. We're in Christ, who's in God, with the fourth part of the Trinity. In him, it's all about him, we just receive. We're the the beloved. We're We're the recipients of all this as a gift. In him, We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. He did it on us as we were the beloved. In all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. As a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things, things in heaven, things on earth. Heaven and earth together. That's what mature sons do, bring heaven to earth. Not wait for rapture, not wait for revival, but bring heaven to earth. In us and out there. In him, we have obtained an inheritance, not wages, free gift, inheritance by new birth, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, his purpose, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. We don't do it. He did it. He is working all things to the counsel of his will. We surrender to this. He will cause you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, the audience, when you heard of the word of truth, you received the word, that's all you did. When you heard the word of truth, just by hearing, like you're doing now, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance as we acquire possession of it, the praise of his glory. We're receiving an inheritance. The more you look like him, the more you can have. And God has given us tutors and governors to get us there. Why? The praise of his glory. To become more like him, to have more stuff, is the praise of his glory. It was his good will and all wisdom and all insight. It was his perfect will that this has been given to you. You're born again. You have it already. Don't do anything to get it. Just ask God to father you to become like him. Okay. That's a very good platform introduction. We can go lots of places from here. So thank you, everyone. You've listened very well. Uh, I preach very concept intense, but it is to plow the soil so that we get a hundredfold return. Okay. Welcome back, Joseph. Thanks. Wow. Um, I I don't definitely don't have anything to add um, to anything that he said. Um, Absolutely fantastic. Chris is somebody that um, <clears throat> that has the capacity to take mystic concepts and mystic things and make it palpable to um, everybody. And um, right now, um, I'm a, of the belief, and I have been for a long time, um, but now it's beginning to come to pass, um, that the world needs what Chris carries. Um, and not just America, the whole world. Um, and right now, we've got him, uh, we've got him here. Um, and I've got him 12 minutes uh, that way. Um, and so I'm going to shout it from the rooftops um, and I'm going to put him on every, pla- every every platform that I've ever tried to create. And then the reason, one, the reason is because I love him and two, because um, of the amazing palpability that his words carry and, and the amazing ways he can translate it into um, language that is uh, swallowable. Um, it's, and what it is, guys, is actually, it's a manifestation of wisdom. Um, and that is, um, that is absolutely what Chris, uh, Chris is, is doing. It, it is a manifestation of wisdom, um, along with understanding and knowledge. But um, I, I'm just, I'm so freaking excited. Um, amazing. So, um, see you guys.